Okay, so you know, where, one question, one thing I'll tell you before we start is where did this all come from? Where did this whole interest in infant feeding come from? Um, we had a big project funded by the Economic and Social Research Council on breastfeeding. Um, this started when I was still working at Essex University. And the reason that we did this is that, you know, at the time, lots and lots and lots of things were known about the health benefits of breastfeeding, but less was known about various other outcomes associated with breastfeeding. Um, and so in this project, we looked at three other things. Cognitive development, which is basically how well your brain and intelligence and everything work out, children's psychosocial and emotional development, and also we looked at maternal depression. And after that, I started thinking, well, actually, you know, we know loads and loads of things about breastfeeding, but um, I became very interested in looking at what parenting books were telling people to do. And as you all probably know, there's loads and loads of books which are, you know, really telling mothers to feed their babies to a schedule very, very strongly, very forcefully. And I started wondering about the evidence base for that. And so that's where I got into this other thing, you know, to asking the question, well, does feeding on demand or feeding to a schedule make any difference? So um, before I go any further as well, I just need to acknowledge my co-authors who are listed there. It's Almadena Sevilla, who's currently at the University of Oxford, and Christina Borra, who is at the University of Sevilla in Spain. So one of my co-authors has got the same name as the other one's university, um, <laughs> weirdly enough. Um, and also, I just need to acknowledge the Economic and Social Research Council, because they did fund most of this research. All of the research that I'm going to tell you about relies on the same sample of um, mothers and babies. So I'll tell you about the sample at the beginning. It's called the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children. And there's about 10,500 babies in this sample who were born in 1990 and 1991, and they were all born in and around the Bristol area. So it's a very large survey, and it's all also a very rich survey because these mothers and fathers and babies were not just interviewed once, they were repeatedly surveyed. So they were surveyed three times, both the mother and the father, during the pregnancy, um, repeatedly over the course of the children's growth and development. They, you know, they were revisited and asked about all kinds of things, their economic circumstances, the baby's development, the mother's mental well-being, the way that the mother was bringing up the baby, and so on and so on. Um, and in addition, there's all sorts of other information spliced in from various sources. So the children had clinical assessments as well. They were kind of weighed and measured. Um, the children's teachers also commented on their progress in various ways. The teachers sort of assessed the children's psychosocial development, for example, their behavior in school, their adjustment. Um, and also, we have in there data sort of spliced in from the national, from national tests. So these are the SATs tests that children take. At the time of this cohort, they were taking them at 5, 7, 11, and 14. So that's lots and lots of tests. Okay, so the first question is, does breastfeeding lead to better cognitive and psychosocial development? Um, you know, so do, be do breastfed babies end up kind of doing better at school, or whatever? Um, and so for this, as the outcome variable in ALSPAC, this is measured, as I said, at ages 5, 7, 11, and 14. The tests are slightly different. So at ages 5 and 7, it's reading, writing, and maths that are measured. And at 11 and 14, it's English, maths, and science. And there was a separate IQ test which was given to children when they were aged eight. Now, if you just plot the raw data, you see this. So on the horizontal axis of these graphs, the top one relates to their English attainment at school at age 16, and the bottom one relates to their attainment in maths. They're both the same shape. And basically, on the horizontal axis, it shows you the number of days of breastfeeding they've got. So it ranges from 0 to 500. 
And on the vertical axis, it's a sort of standardized test score. And you can see that there's this massive relationship between breastfeeding and how well you do at school. So we could just say now, okay, case closed, breastfed kids do better. But of course, it's more complicated than that. And that is because just because we see this relationship between the two variables does not mean that we've proved anything relating to the causality. The problem is, so we see this big relationship here, breastfeeding and the child outcome, which in this case is how well they do at school. But of course, the problem is that lots of other factors are related to both of those things. So maternal education, for example, is a really strong predictor in this country, in any case, of whether a mother will breastfeed. And it's also a really strong predictor of how well the child does in school. And so this relationship that we observe between the breastfeeding and the cognitive attainment could in part, or possibly in whole, just be due to the confounding effect of maternal education. And it's not just that. Smoking as well. Mothers who smoke are less likely to breastfeed. Mothers who smoke also are um, less likely to have, well, their, their children do slightly less well in school. So, you know, it goes on, it goes on. We can look at social class, we can look at sort of housing, you know. And so essentially, it is very difficult, even though we see this huge big relationship between the breastfeeding on the one hand and the child outcomes on the other, it's very difficult to identify which portion of that is actually causal and which portion of that just arises because of these other <coughs> confounding factors. So here's just a little graph just to show you that educated women are indeed much more likely to breastfeed, which probably you all know anyway. So those with a university degree, which are the ones on the top right, at the time of the ALSPAC survey, 70% of them initiated breastfeeding. Now, of course, the, number, the figures would be even higher, whereas um, only about 25% of those with the lowest educational qualifications would initiate breastfeeding. And the same is true for all of these other indicators and more. So what do we do to kind of tease out the causality here? Well, one thing that is often done in medicine is this thing called randomized controlled trials, which is you know that you take all the babies and you say to the mothers, right, this lot that we've randomly selected, you guys are gonna breastfeed and to the other lot of mothers, right, you guys are not going to breastfeed, and then we're going to look at the difference between the two. Now, you don't have to be a genius to realize that that is not a very good, you know, you can't do that if you're looking at breastfeeding. Number one, because it's completely unethical, because we know that breastfeeding is so good for children in lots of other ways. And number two, because the mothers just won't play ball. The compliance is likely to be an issue. So forget the randomized controlled trials. There are some sibling studies which say, okay, we're going to look at pairs of siblings, and in those pairs of siblings, we're going to assume that everything else is the same, you know, that the parental household background is the same, and all of those other confounding factors are the same, and then the difference between these pairs of siblings um, will tell us what the causal effect of breastfeeding is. So we could do that. Unfortunately, there is not huge amounts of data on sibling pairs, but it is a thing you could done, you could do. Um, I'm going to skip this thing about genetics, but you could ask me about it afterwards if you want. You could study countries with a different socioeconomic gradient to the UK. So it's interesting, in Brazil, for example, it is more affluent mothers who tend to to um, feed with formula, and less affluent mothers who can't afford the formula who tend to breastfeed. So if you look at the difference between um, breastfed and formula-fed babies there and compare it to the difference that you find in countries like the UK, that could give you a handle on what's going on. Um, what we're going to use, however, with this nice big data set that we've got is statistical techniques. And the one that we're going to use is called propensity score matching. So I'm going to whiz you through that, essentially, a baby's born, it's breastfed or it's not breastfed, and then we observe the outcome for the baby. Now, if we had a randomized controlled trial, as we were talking about before, we could say, yeah, okay, this difference that we observe between the two sets of outcomes, that's causal, because the babies were randomized. However, of course, we don't have that. Um, 
because we know that babies who are breastfed have, are in different sets of circumstances than babies who are not breastfed. So what we'd really like to see, if we just go back, we've got the babies who are not breastfed, we know their outcomes, and what we would really like to see is the outcome for those babies if they had been breastfed. Sadly, the problem is that you can't observe the same baby twice in two different sets of circumstances. You can't just sort of rewind and say, okay, now let's do it the other way and see how that baby turns out. It doesn't work like that. So we have this problem that is called the sort of unobserved counterfactual problem. If we did observe the counterfactual, then we could say, yeah, the difference between those two things, that would represent the causal effect of breastfeeding. So in propensity score matching, we do something that's a little bit clever. We don't observe the counterfactual, so we synthesize it. This is what we do. We've got the breastfed babies, and we've got the non-breastfed babies, and then we take a non-breastfed baby and we match it. Now, something has slipped on this graph, so these circles are meant to go round the mothers, okay? So you just have to pretend they do. Um, okay, so we find a mother that hasn't breastfed, and then we match her. We look at all sorts of things. We look at her income, her marital status. We look at how many other children she's got. We look at how old she is. We look at her educational levels. We look at the quality of the area, that, the characteristics of the area that she lives in. Her, the sort of house she lives in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Loads and loads of stuff, whether she smoked in pregnancy, whether she drank in pregnancy, her attitudes toward, towards all kinds of things, and then we can match her with a mother from this group. And then we can do it with another mother, and we can do it with another mother, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so, until, in the end, we have a sample in pink of the mothers that didn't breastfeed, and a sample in pink of the mothers that did breastfeed, but look in all observable respects just like the mothers who didn't breastfeed. The ones in grey are the mothers that we were not able to match, okay? Those were mothers, and in particular, there are um, some mothers who don't breastfeed who actually there's nobody really very much like them in the breastfeeding group, and they're not in the analysis, so we're comparing like with like, and if we compare those two groups, then we are getting somewhere quite close to what might be a causal effect. So that, in a nutshell, is what propensity score matching is all about. What do we find? Now, if so, I don't know if you can read those down there, but basically, all of those are tests, are the school tests, the school-based tests that the babies do. The ones on the left are at age five, and the ones on the right are at age 15, and the others are somewhere in the middle. And if you look at the raw results, this is if we don't do propensity score matching and we don't control for anything, these differences are absolutely enormous. They are of the order of about 40% of a standard deviation. Now, I know that that is statistics speak, but just believe me, it's huge. Okay, absolutely massive. However, remember what we were talking about before, that loads and loads of that association is to do with the fact that the breastfeeding mothers are more educated and generally in more favorable circumstances. If you do the propensity score matching exercise, it definitely goes down, it reduces a lot, but it is still statistically significant and we think that these estimates do quite accurately represent the causal effect of breastfeeding on children's cognitive development. You'll notice that on the left, at age five, the estimates are lower and the bars cross the horizontal axis, so they're not actually statistically significant. But by the time we go over to the right, they are bigger. They're of the order of 10% of a standard deviation. Now, these estimates in pink are, what we're doing here is we are looking at the babies who were breastfed and saying, okay, what would have happened to them if they hadn't have been breastfed? And you know, what have they gained by being breastfed? But there is another way that you can do this, which is that you can say, okay, let's look at the babies that weren't breastfed, match them with babies that were breastfed, and see what the difference with them is. 
And if you look at the difference there, the little blue dots that are just slightly above those, you'll see that those estimates are a little bit higher than the other ones. Now, um, the pink dots are called the average treat the average treatment effect on the treated the average average effect on the treated this is how much did those breastfed babies gain by being breastfed but the pink ones is the average effect on the untreated and that is how much would the babies that aren't breastfed have gained by if they had have been breastfed and this is higher and you know we might think well why why would this be the case and of course the reason is that <laughs> Typically, babies who are not breastfed are sort of generally in riskier circumstances and therefore kind of have a bit more to gain. They've got more potential to make up by being breastfed. So anyway, the bottom line here is that we have identified, we think, a causal effect of breastfeeding on cognitive development. Now, in terms of any policy implications, actually there are not very many because really we recommend breastfeeding anyway because it's good for babies' health in other respects. But this is kind of an interesting thing to know.